Good afternoon, Emos. This is your instructor. Uh, last, I have an opportunity to talk to you a little bit about some of the things that are we've been discussing. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about mucus controlling drugs. Uh, we sometimes forget really how important mucus is. Uh, this is one of the major things that we do with our patients to keep them safe and to make sure that we can get them better. What we're going to do, first of all, we need to define terms. Remember, terminology is really, really important. And as a result of that, we need to make sure we understand what we're talking about, talking about mucus controlling drug therapy. We want to look and see what happens, how does this happen, and what needs to be done to ensure that it happens appropriately at this particular point. There's different types of medications. They all have different modes of action. And then we're going to see what happens if, if you don't have mucus clearance going on. We're going to look at the contraindications to the use of some of these medications. Uh, some of these medications are things that after you've used them for a while, you start to get a little bit concerned and you want to make sure that you've educated everybody on how you need to be able to use these drugs. And then we're going to look at some of, very quickly, some of the airway clearing devices. These are something that we're going to talk quite a bit about, about in therapeutics. It'll make it a lot easier for us at that point. So first thing to remember is the primary way that we protect our airway is with a cough. However, if we have mucus that's way too thick or mucus that's not moving, we're going to impede that cough. And so when we do that, we're going to now have problems with defending the, mecha defending the mechanism of our lungs, keeping the bacteria out of it, um, preventing inflammation and uh, diseases that are um, really going to cause us problems. Mucus is a barrier to airway water loss and microbial invasion, and we have to get rid of all that foreign, inhaled foreign matter. Remember, if you've just swallowed a fly and it's going down your trachea, you don't want it to stay there. You actually want to get rid of it, and the mucus is going to help you do that. We're going to talk about the fact that it's a visioelastic gel consisting of water. It has high molecular weight glycoproteins, and we call these mucins mixed with serum and cellular proteins and lipids. And how thick it is really depends on how effective our cough is going to be, or if it's much looser, how effective the cough can be. Okay, remember, the mucociliary escalator is your major defense system. And it's designed to go ahead and protect the lung and to clear the lung of respiratory pathogens that cause disease and infection. Um, it is a self-renewing, self-cleansing escalator. Uh, it propels mucus from the distal to the proximal airways. Um, different diseases will affect it. They can either make it extremely thick to where the patient can't cough it out, or it can make it less thick, but the patient still has problems coughing, but is at least able to remove some of the secretions at that particular point in time. Um, remember, too, that mucus is a gel. It has viscosity and elasticity. When we look at mucus, a lot of times, if you've ever looked at yours when you've had a really bad cold or anything, you can see that it has a tendency to stretch out. And if you need to, you can make a little system city with it or a little play area, too. That always kind of works. Uh, some of the other properties of mucus, it's protecting, lubricating, waterproofing, and trapping microorganisms. By doing that, we're inhibiting bacterial infections, and we're preventing biofilm formation. Biofilm has been indicted into some of the bacterial infections that we have to deal with with our respiratory patients. So this is just, as you can see, two cilia and two of the goblet cells are talking at this particular point, and they're getting rid of those, those microbes that aren't supposed to be there. So some of the clinical uses of the drugs that we have are to reduce the accumulation of our airway secretions, improve pulmonary function and gas exchange, and prevent repeated infection and airway damage. You guys have done pulmonary function testing. Any of you who had 
uh, irritated airways. You know that when you were doing all that blowing and everything, that it was very difficult for you, and in a lot of cases made you cough, and it was very uncomfortable. Uh, some of the diseases that we have problems with mucus are our obstructive diseases, cystic fibrosis, is, happens to be the classic one that we see a lot of problems with. Chronic bronchitis, asthma is another one. Any of you guys who have asthma and know somebody who has asthma knows that when they're having an exacerbation of their asthmatic um, fun asthma, then what's basically is happening is they're producing a lot of uh, mucus. If you watch and see what they cough out, a lot of times we see the castings where we can see where in the airways the mucus actually came from. Um, bronchiectasis is another one that produces a lot of mucus that we have problems with. Um, primary ciliary dyskinesia, a lot of times babies are born with this. Um, in this case, their cilia are not going to work for them. They're going to have some issues with coughing and clearing their airways. Uh, we have to watch, watch and make sure that they don't have a lot of infections, bacterial invasions, and things like that. Diffuse pan bronchiolitis is actually a disease, it's an idiopathic disease that um, we see a lot of over in Japan and it basically causes a lot of problems with the respiratory bronchioles and what it basically does is it builds up in the airways and becomes a severe obstructive respiratory disorder. If it's not treated, unfortunately what will happen is, is the airways will be invaded by all this mucus, and when it does, the patient will end up in respiratory failure, and in some cases that leads to their death at that particular point. So when we're talking about using our drugs, we've tried other things first. For example, we have some of our adjuncts that we're going to use to help move mucus, and those are the ones we're going to talk about in Therapeutics 2. Um, the other thing is, is that we need to remove irritants. Irritants, the one that we can always blame is tobacco smoke. Uh, we can also look at chemicals. You know, what do you do for a living? If you're a pool cleaner and use a lot of acid and things like that, if you're being exposed to it because you're in a closed area, then we can see problems with it also, with your mucus and your airways. So some of the agents that we deal with are acetylcysteine, which is its brand name is Mucamist. This one reduces viscosity of mucus by separating disulfide bonds. Um, there's a lot of information we have on Mucamist. The unfortunately, the majority of it that we have at this particular point is extremely negative, but um, we still use it, unfortunately. Okay, um, Dornase Alpha is a, what we call a recumbent human dyroxynuclease one enzyme produced in cultured Chinese hamster ovary cells. And that's kind of an interesting place to get something like this. Um, this is actually used for patients who have cystic, cystic fibrosis. It reduces the viscosity of mucus by separating the leukocyte DNA, which is the problem that we have with patients who have cystic fibrosis. Other things we can use is water. We can use hypertonic water, hypotonic water, isotonic water. Um, some of this water has a lot of saline, very little saline. It's a very irritating to the airways. Um, sometimes when your physicians will ask you to go ahead and do a sputum sample for, for them, they will ask you to use one of these um, solutions, the hypertonic, hypotonic, or whatever. And what we have to watch for is when we're irritating the airway is to make sure the patient doesn't have bronchoconstriction or bronchospasm. What we are doing is we're actually using a hypermolar saline for CF patients, that's a 7% saline, and mannitol. Mannitol is an, what we call an osmotic diuretic. It doesn't work in the kidneys, it actually works in the uh, body, in the blood-brain area at that point, removes uh, any excess fluid from the brain. It does a really good job of that. Um, at one time, and I'm sure they're still doing this, they used to use mannitol during open heart surgery to, for its kidney protective properties. So, 
when we're talking about secretions, there's two phases to it, the gel layer and then a weak gel periciliary layer, and that lies between the cell surface and the mucous layer at a depth just a little bit less than the height of a fully extended um, cilia. Okay, this is what we used to call, or still call in some cases, the sole layer. And that's where you're going to find it at this particular point. Um, structures of the system, remember in your airways, uh, the surface is epithelial cells, the pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelial cells. You also have surface goblet cells, clara cells that you now can find in the literature called club cells in the distal airway. And you have submucosal glands with serous and mucous cells as far as those go. Mucus that's secreted by the surface uh, epithelial cells and glands provide for the basic protection of our respiratory tract, including the humidification and the warming of inspired gases, mucociliary transport of debris, waterproofing so that we don't dehydrate, and then insulating in an antibacterial activity. And this is your picture of the airway, just to remind you of what it looks like. You can see the PCL layer, uh, the ciliated cells, the goblet cells, the basal cells, and you can see where the surface, airway surface is at this particular point. So some of the terminology we want to talk about, mucal active agents, they have an effect on the mucus secretions. The mucokinetic agent, this increases your cough or ciliary clearance of your respiratory secretions. If we can start coughing a lot of times, we can now get this uh, mucus to start moving. Uh, the biggest thing, of course, for that is going to determine um, how thick the secretion is as to how fast the cough can actually occur. We have mucal regulatory agents reduce the volume of the airway mucus secretions. Mucus specific agents this increased the viscosity of the secretions. Remember, viscosity has to do with the thickness. Uh, you see that on the TV all the time talking about oil, uh, the viscosity of the oil when you change your, your in, in your car. And then you have mucolytic, mucolytic agents that degrade the polymers in the secretion. The surface epithelial cells include ciliated and goblet cells in a ratio of approximately 5 to 1. There's about 6,000 goblet cells per millimeter square of normal airway. They're not directly innervated in the human lung, but they do respond to irritants and inflammatory mediators and peptides by increasing the production of mucus. That's how you're part of your protection of your airway. Your submucosal glands, for the most part, provide airway surface mucin. Mucin is secreted by the salivary glands, and it consists of your uh, glycosaliated proteins that are approximately 50 to 80 percent carbohydrates by weight and are produced in the epithelial cells and the mucin secreting goblet cells. Uh, under they are under parasympathetic control. They respond to cholinergic stimulation by increasing the amount of mucus secreted, if you remember the Ackerman sludge. There's two types of cells that we find in these glands, and they are the, your mucus and your serous. This is sort of a picture of your ciliary, how it works. It's almost like a whip if you look over there. These, uh, the cilia, they come up. They're moving in one direction. They remember, we're moving from the distal to the proximal airways. When they come back down, they actually go down and they actually um, sort of glide on that top gel layer so that they don't take anything back with them at this particular point. There's 200 cilia per cell, and you can see they vary in sizes depending on where they are. They have an effective power stroke, and that's what you're seeing here in the slide. They have a recovery stroke where they're coming back, and um, the functional surfactant layer separates the periciliary fluid from the mucus gels. So particles deposited distal to the ciliated epithelium, as well as some particles deposited on this epithelium are cleared much more slowly from the airway, and this may occur, occur through the interaction of several mechanisms 
which include dissolving of particles in the epithelial lining fluid, interstitial fluid, or phasocytotic cells transported by the um, facial cytotic system. Okay, remember those are your alveolar macrophages and polymorphic leukocytes at that particular point. And this is just a little picture showing you again of the wave. You can see again, here's your gel layer and your saw layer and, and how these cilia actually do move. So factors that affect the mucociliary transport rate, um, depending on where we're talking about it, uh, which part of the lung at this particular point, uh, it slows down with airway damage. This can be your smoking. This can be the irritants that you've been exposed to. Uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is one. Cystic fibrosis, airway drying. Book talked about the use of dry gases for mechanical ventilation. It's also the dry gases we give to our patients when they come into the hospital. They don't have to be mechanically ventilated. If we give them a nasal cannula, any of the mask, we can actually dry their airways out fairly well for them. Narcotics or something else, and then endotracheal suctioning because we're removing the protection when we're taking some of that so the uh, irritants out. Uh, some of the other things, airway trauma, a tracheostomy, patients who have a tracheostomy have that bypassed upper airway. Uh, remember, in order to be able to introduce um, and maintain the appropriate amount of um, flu or... Anyways, remember the tracheostomy, we bypass the upper airway, and so we're not able to go ahead and reach the 37 degrees uh, temperature of water that we want to put into our lungs. Cigarette smoking, we talked a little bit about that. Any of the pollutants that are in the um, atmosphere. Um, if you notice, the sky looks a lot clearer these days because there's not so much traffic out there. Um, hyperoxia, too much oxygen. Hypoxia is another one. Depending on how the patient's breathing, Remember, if they're not breathing through their nose, they're not going to go ahead and um, saturate the air that they breathe in. And if you look on Table 9.2, you're going to see the effects of some of the drugs on transport. And um, it includes our bronchodilators, our anticholinergics, and some of the other ones. Food intake and mucus production. This is kind of an interesting one. Um, they did a whole paragraph on this talking about milk and dairy don't seem to increase the amount of mucus production. Um, all the research they studied like somewhere around 60 healthy subjects and none of them had any problems with it and as a result of that. Okay, anyways, um, they came out and they basically said there's no association between milk and dairy and increased secretions. Howsomever, you guys may know somebody or yourself that if you do drink some dairy products or you eat in some cases like chocolates, especially M&Ms, that you do have an increased mucus production. It's a thickening uh, at that particular point. So what happens when the cilia doesn't work? Uh, you can see that unhappy little goblet cell there. Um, he's trying to get it to see what he can do, but the mucus, unfortunately, is too thick. Uh, he just finished a chocolate milkshake from McDonald's. So a little bit about the nature of mucus secretion. Remember, you move about 100 mLs every 24 hours. Clear, little elasticity to it can be sometimes be sticky. Um, most is either reabsorbed in the bronchial mucosa or swallowed with saliva. Uh, we don't even know when we're removing that 100 mLs uh, because the cilia will move it up and we end up swallowing it on occasions too. So mucins are responsible for the protective and clearance properties of mucus. Um, primary function, transporting, removing trapped inhaled particles, cellular debris, and dead and aging cells is what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to keep our airway pretty clean for us at this point.
So when we're healthy, the mucin glycoproteins are their major component of the mucus gel. Under normal conditions, they can absorb salt and water driven by an active sodium transport. Remember, you have your sodium potassium transport. Uh, the normal epithelia can also secrete liquid into the periciliary fluid driven by the chloride transport through the ion channels and passively through your aquaporins or water channels. In disease states, things change, though. Mucus or mucociliary clearances can be abnormal in chronic bronchitis, asthma, cystic fibrosis, throat emphysema, and there also um, it can be altered by changes in volume, hydration, composition of the secretions, and the ciliary function. If you're not feeling well, a lot of times you're not drinking. If you're not drinking, you're dehydrating. When you're dehydrating, the body is going to pull moisture from wherever it can. And now we're going to start to see the thickening of the uh, cilia um, of the uh, what is it of the mucus in the cell and the inhibition of the cilia movement. So there, if you look, some just quick definitions of some diseases, chronic bronchitis, daily sputum for three months per year for at least two consecutive years. We have hyperplasia of the submucosal mucosal glands and goblet cells. Asthma, we see a hypersecretions during acute episodes. And then what we can see with this, too, as you can see, with severe and fatal asthma, secretions are highly viscous and rigid and they can compete with airway, um, complete airway obstruction at that point. And this is, like I said, this is where we see our castings. Bronchorrhea, production of large volumes of watery sputum. You know, it just comes out, looks like a water faucet. Plastic bronchitis is another rare disease. This is the formation of large gelatinous or rigid branching airway cast. Um, you have to go in and remove this. Uh, the unfortunate thing is it's, it comes back and it continues to come back. Um, so we're still trying to figure out how to resolve that one. Cystic fibrosis, chronic airway infection, inflammation. Uh, the major uh, disease we see with these guys is going to be your Pseudomonas arginosa. And one of the things, if, if you know somebody who has CF, if they're starting to get sick, you can actually smell the pseudomonas if you're talking to them. Uh, it can sometimes lead to bronchiectasis. Bronchiectasis has a lot of mucus and airway obstruction of, of its own, and it's a progressive pulmonary function decline happens with these folks, and unfortunately, eventually, they'll end up dying from it. So some of the physical properties of mucus, it's viscous, it has elasticity, it's cohesive, and it has adhesivity. Adhesive forces, this is the attraction between mucus and the airway surface. They're unlike molecules. They're just like a ball in a bat if you're playing baseball, okay? Um, surfactant helps reduce this, and it makes sense because if you remember in pulmonary AMP, when we talked about surfactant, we said surfactant keeps the alveoli from sticking to each other. So we'd expect the same thing to happen in this case. Agents that increase the power of airflow and cough. This is really, really good because you have to have airflow in order to cough. Um, mucolytics can sever. Ah, I found the word bonding of mucus and epithelium. It reduces frictional adhesion also at this particular point. Cohesive forces, this is attraction between like molecules. We're going to talk a little bit about spinability. It's kind of an interesting concept. Rheology is the study of the deformation and flow of matter. Viscosity is the resistance of fluid to flow. Um, it's some type of an impedance at this particular point. And elasticity is basically returning back to where you were before a lot of other things happened at this particular point. So basically, mucus is a viscoelastic material. 
as a solid. The gel has elastic deformation. It stores energy within it, so that's why it's able to return to its shape. Uh, as a liquid, it flows under applied force, and it loses its energy. It just continues moving. And this is just um, panels that show mucosal disease to abnormal mucus. In asthma, the airway remodeling is characterized by increases in the epithelium mucin stores because of the surface epithelium mucus metaplasia with modest hyperplasia and an increased numbers of subepithelial bronchial microvessels that become leaky during inflammation. And you can see down at here, it talks about how much mucin you have with the healthy state, and then the different disease states, the plasma proteins, and they have a tendency to decrease quite a bit in asthma. Inflammatory cells, unfortunately our patients with CF have quite a few of those. We see an increase in DNA, that's where part of their pro mucus problem is. Actin is in there too, and then bacteria quite a bit with those too. Um, both our COPD and our, our CF, but our patients with CF seem to have the most. So spinability or cohesiveness of the music, uh, mucus for the most part, this is like drawing out threads. And they actually found this in cervical mucus first, and then they realized it also occurred in the lungs. And it tells us about how much cohesion is there. Uh, the thicker the mucus, the longer the threads. You can pull them. It's almost like taking a piece of gum that's really kind of um, old and pulling it apart and pulling it to see how long it's going to come. It'll stretch out before it breaks. Tenacity is one of the strongest determinants. So tenacity is one of the strongest determinants of the sputum's ability to be to clear through coughing. Um, if you think about it, if a dog has a bone, if you go up to take the bone, he's not going to give it up, okay? So some of the mucolactive agents, mucolus, mucolus lysis, and mucociliary clearance, they decrease the elasticity and the viscosity. Uh, because you, the gel structure is broken down. Uh, therapeutic options for controlling hypersecretions. Remove whatever's causing it at that particular point. If you're smoking, give up smoking. If you're working with chemicals, wear a protective mask. Do whatever else you have to at that particular point in time. Uh, optimize tracheobronchial clearance. There's a way of um, reducing the amount, the viscosity and the um, tenacity of your secretions. And then use mucoactive agents when indicated. Mucolytics and expectorants are another thing that we can do. Uh, expectorants help reduce re, um, the viscosity and the tenacity, and it helps you cough up the secretions. If you look on table 9-3, it talks about some of those different agents. So one of them, and we use quite a bit of this one, is N-acetylcysteine. The brand name is Mucamist, so you'll know that one. Um, why do we use it? It's associated with vicious secre secretions. Uh, we know that it's really not effective for a lot of the things that we do. It smells like rotten eggs. It reacts with plastic. If a patient's using a mask for a treatment, it coats the inside of the mask, um, and it's really, really annoying. It makes you nauseous. In some cases, may cause vomiting at that particular point. Um, we do have a good use for it, though. Um, if you decide to overdose on Tylenol, if you want to save your liver, you need to come into the hospital um, within eight hours, and we're going to set you up on 18 treatments of Mucamist. Um, there is uh, an IV form of it. A lot of times, though, you get to drink 18 glasses of your favorite beverage with this rotten egg um, smell included with it. But at least you'll have a liver when it, en when it ends up. Uh, we do know it doesn't improve mucus clearance when given as an aerosol or given orally. 
shouldn't be used, but we do. It is really harsh on the lung tissue, um, causes a lot of bleeding. We don't want to really use it for more than 96 hours. For 90, 96 hours. Um, and if we are going to use it, it has to be refrigerated to prevent contamination because it comes in vials, about 10 to 20 percent um, solution. So what does it do? It disrupts the structure of the mucous polymer. It has, that breaks the disulfide bonds. Uh, some of the hazards with it, um, it is causes bronchospasm, bronchoconstriction. We see it less with the 10% solution than we do with the 20% solution. Um, normally give anywhere, depending on the books you're looking at, two to four um, mLs of this, depending on the strength of the um, that you're using at that particular point. It does cause a mechanical obstruction of the airway. Gives you a little stomatitis, nausea, and rhinorrhea. Rhinorrhea is when we're turning your secretions into liquid. Uh, what happens, unfortunately, if we use this too long, the secretions do turn into a very liquefied state. And um, sometimes, because it's so liquefied, patients have a hard time coughing them out. The other thing is it's incompatible with antibiotics and mixture, and you can see a bunch of the antibiotics here at this particular point. Dornase alpha or pulmazine, um, it's indicated for clearance of purulent secretions and cystic fibrosis, uh, a fairly expensive drug, it costs close to $3,100 for a 30-day supply works out to like $150 a day is basically what you're using uh, for these. You don't want to use it um, with other than patients who have CF. It doesn't work quite as well and it does cause some problems. It affects their pulmonary function and some other issues with it too. It's safe and effective in patients with more severe pulmonary disease, and this is defined as a forced vital capacity, less than 40% of predicted values. So it doesn't work well with COPD, okay, because COPD has proteins in their secretions. Patients with CF actually have neutrophil derived pus at that particular point. It's a recumbent form of the human DNA I enzyme. And like I said, it comes from the ovaries of your Chinese hamsters. Uh, it digests extracellular DNA. So why do we use it? Clearing purulent secretions, reduce the frequency of respiratory infections where you have to have IV antibiotics and to improve or preserve pulmonary function in these subjects. One thing you wanna know, and you'll hear this again in diseases, when you're taking care of a patient who has cystic fibrosis, if it's time for their treatment, if you go in there, if they're taking a nap or sleeping or doing something, you know, playing in a game or something, you don't go in there and say, oh, I'll come back. They're actually going to kick you out of their room. You need to go in there and say, it's time for your treatment. We need to be doing this in order to get better at this particular point in time. Um, they'll work with you at that point. So... Just remember that. How does it um, work? Dornase, when given by an aerosol, reduces viscosity and adhesivity by breaking down the DNA. So how do we give it? It's available as a single-use ample, ample yeah, of 2.5 milligrams of a drug in a 2.5 milliliter clear colorless solution. Uh, it's delivered by an one of these approved nebulizers. Unfortunately, sometimes we don't have those, so we'll just normally use the nebulizers we have. It has to be given by itself. You cannot mix it with other drugs. And in some cases, they used to have to change the nebulizers at the end of every day. So there's a lot of other cost that goes with this. Oops, I made a mistake. It's $105 a day for this. And it is an orphan drug because of cystic fibrosis for the most part. It needs to be refrigerated and protected from light.
And it's actually the, the last thing we're going to give if we're giving you a series of drugs because there's different ones that we have. This is another drug, um, just like uh, I didn't mention with mucamus, but I need to mention here. Uh, we need to give these drugs either for, I mean, after or mixed with a bronchodilator uh, because of the bronchoconstriction, bronchospasm. And um, Dornase, unfortunately, has to be given after because it can't be mixed with, with a bronch bronchodilator. So adverse effects, there's a little difference between Dornase Alpha and placebo. What we do see, though, as you can see, voice alteration, pharyngitis, laryngitis, rash, chest pain, and conjunctivitis. So clinical application evaluation based on lung function, the reduction of the number and severity of infectious exacerbations, and the need for antibiotics and hospitalization. Same thing that we talk about when we're trying to um, find out if our bronchodilators are working, uh, same type of um, evaluation we're going to do. This is something that I read in the book and I've been looking online. I'm not quite sure what's going on with these. Your book talks a little bit about it, so just take a look at it. I'm not going to test you on it. But we include the expectorants as part of our mucolytics and they are antitussives also at this particular point. So these little guys are showing you some of the things that these can do to you, such as GI upset, dizziness, drowsiness, vomiting, some other really cool things. So one of them is sodium bicarbonate. Okay, this thing, what we think is is that there's going to draw water into to secretions. And if we can put water in the secretions, we're going to be able to go ahead and decrease the viscosity at that particular point. But it's not been clinically proven to um, improve airway clearance, fortunately. Um, however, in cystic fibrosis, there's a loss of airway bicarbonate transport. Um, and sometimes what we're looking at now is trying to help the, our patients uh, with CF uh, to be able to use the bicarbonate to see if it'll help them with it at that particular point. Guafinacin is one that if you go to your doctor, um, he will or, or she will order it for you. Uh, one of the things he'll tell you or she'll tell you is that you need to drink a lot of water when you're taking guafinocent. It's an interesting one. We had a conversation with one of the pulmonologists one time, and he was basically talking about the fact that he wasn't sure if it was the guafinocent or all the water that you had to drink that actually um, broke down the secretions so where you could cough them out. Uh, Adderall is a new one. This is a DPI mannitol that's actually been um, on the market. It's been tested for the bronchial challenge testing in pulmonary function laboratory. It actually works better than the methacholine um, at this particular point. So some of your mucokinetic agents, these increase cough clearance by increasing expiratory airflow or reducing your sputum adhesity and tenacity. These are, some of these are your bronchodilators that you covered in chapter six and seven. It increases the ciliary beat, but has very little effect really on doing much um, reducing of sputum's adhesiveness or tenacity. It can increase your expiratory airflow though by relaxing the airway. And if it does do that, it can sometimes increase mucus production. The downside of this, it can decrease expiratory airflow and produce a dynamic airway collapse if you have what we call floppy airways due to bronchiomalacia or tracheomalacia, which is a, where the airways will collapse on themselves. So we have to be aware of that. You also have some surface active phospholipids. Okay, We use these in patients with chronic um, bronchitis. It's shown to improve pulmonary functioning and sputum transportility. It's also very dose dependent, so you have to make sure you get the right dose at that particular point. 
It also increases the uh, lower airway depositions of other medications, such as Dornase Alpha, and we're going to talk a little bit about gene therapy vectors. And so this is actually a thin surfactant that we actually can use. And it, you can see it is effective in treating chronic bronchitis and cystic fibrosis. Mucoregulatory medications, these decrease mucus hypersecretions. Steroids, when we talk about steroids, these are anti-inflammatories. They cut down on inflammation for you. The anticholinergics, remember, uh, their major side effect is drying, and we're going to go ahead and dry things out for you. The macrolide antibiotics, these all came from erythromycin. They're actually used to treat bacterial infections. However, as a result of treating these bacterial infections, they decrease the inflammation to more normal and beneficial levels. So they really not, are not drying out the hypersecretions. Antiproteases, these are shown that the neutrophil protease causes secretory responses from submucosal glands with an increase in mucus production. Uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin, either, IB, either by IV or inhalation, suppresses the neutrophil elastase and restores the bacteria killing uh, capability in the neutrophils. Remember, your neutrophil is your number one white cell um, that actually fights infections for you instead of causing them. But in this case, um, when they're starting to degrade or become extremely active, they can actually cause more inflammation, and they can also inc increase the amount of mucus being produced. There's also recumbent secretory leukocyte protease inhibitor, and you can take this for about a week, uh, twice a day, um, and it actually decreases the neutrophil elastase also. And the nice thing about it, there's no significant side effects noted with it. Here's your hyperosmolar saline, which is 7% mannitol. It may increase the FEV1 in patients. We're not terribly sure. Uh, the alternate effect is an acute decrease in FEV1. It's very unpleasant tasting. It makes you cough, and therefore it's really not suitable for long-term use. Hypertonic saline is used to irritate the airways and to reduce a cough. And when it does this, it can sometimes improve your mucociliary transport um, and lung function with this coughing. And the big thing is, is keep the airways hydrated. It makes your coughing a whole lot more effective. Gene theory, therapy is something we're working on at this particular point. Um, One of the things that we see, the CFTR gene in CF patients, it's a protein that functions as a channel across the membranes that produce mucus, sweat, saliva, tears, and digestive enzymes. And this is where uh, some of your problems with patients who have CF exist. So for it to be effective, the vector in the package must be non-immune genetic, stable to shear forces, generalization, and safe for transfected cells. So some of the things you're looking at are adenoviruses, adeno-associated viruses, and uh, lentiviruses. And as you can see, here's our goblet cells back again. Unfortunately, there's no ciliary movement. Uh, so things are starting to get pretty backed up at this particular point, and their cough is terribly, terribly ineffective. So some of the things we're going to talk about in therapeutics, uh, these are uh, physio physiotherapy and airway clearance devices. Uh, one you're going to hear about from Trace when teaches peds is postural drainage. We can do postural drainage percussion, CPT. There's the cough assist, uh, active cycle breathing, enforced expiratory technique, autogenic drainage, exercise. Exercise is really important um, with patients who have CF and anybody who really has some problem with their mucus. 
positive airway devices, things like your CPAP, BiPAPs, oscillatory PEP, which is like your flutter, or your aerobica, and your high frequency chest wall, um, which is your vest. And most of these devices that we are going to talk about actually came about to help patients who had cystic fibrosis and they've made their way uh, throughout the community. We use them quite a bit. In the future, we're still looking for things that are going to help us um, more effectively move sec secretions. We're looking for um, other devices or other um, drugs that are going to go ahead and remove the adhesiveness, the cohesiveness, allow us to be take care, better care with our patients with fewer side effects, and get them healthier much, much quicker. So what do we do for our assessment of these patients? It's going to be the same thing we do with our assessment of any of, the, of our drugs or any of our patients, anything we're doing. Uh, what is the level of consciousness of this patient? Can they cough? It's really important to know because if there's something else we need to add to it, we need to talk to our physicians. Um, is there something else we need to give these patients to help them cough and be able to remove their secretions? During the treatment and short term, we need to make sure they know how to use their equipment appropriately and how to take their drugs appropriately. For example, you don't start off with Dornase. You start, use Dornase last. Uh, you remember in chapter six and seven, uh, they basically told you it doesn't matter if you start off with a bronchodilator or a backdoor bronchodilator. It's just a matter of preference in some cases. And most of us, when we were um, growing up, as respiratory therapists, we normally started with a bronchodilator to, so we had better reaction from the other medications that we followed up with. We need to see if what we're doing is actually working. Is the patient able to breathe better? Is the patient able to cough? Are they, in fact, removing the secretions at this point? How much mucus are they producing? It's always nice to have. What is their respiratory rate and pattern? What is their response to what's going on? It's really important for us to ask these patients and get an idea and then watch and see what their reaction is. And if there's any adverse reactions, remember we need to stop, have them rinse out their mouth, make sure that they're safe, that they're stable, and then we report this not only to the nurses and the physicians, uh, but also to our supervisor and anyone else who can help us. Long term, again, how do we know this is working? We cut down on the exacerbations, we cut down on the hospitalizations, we cut down on the infections, uh, we cut down on the lost, uh, lost work days, lost schools, uh, different things along that line. Do they need antibiotics? And if we're doing um, serial PFTs, are they getting better or at least remaining the same at this particular point? So other things we want to look at, if there's a profound uh, airflow compromise, our FAV1, it's going to be less than 25% of predictive, severely compromised, we'll see with the vital capacity, expiratory flow. Other things that can cause this is GERD. Uh, GERD is one of the things we think causes asthma and, and problems with their lungs. Um, a lot of these folks, if they can't manage their secretions, uh, they cannot protect their airway, and they are going to have a lot of um, infections and hospitalizations that we have to watch. And acute bronchitis or exacerbation of chronic disease um, leaves the patient less responsive to treatment. And unfortunately, in the end, with these two guys, as you can see, they have an impaired mucillary ciliary clearance. There's a lot of bacteria that's colonizing at that point. They've invited their friends over for a party, and they have a recurrent respiratory infection.